This video will build up to the next video where we actually animate the emission source and render a more practical scene. RBD emission has a ton of applications that can be applied in many different ways to many different types of scenes. Best thing I love about RBD emission is that it's fast, easy, and cheap. Performance is amazing. In this video, I take the previous project from basic concept number one, RBD emission, and replace the platonic pieces with actual RBD fractured pieces. And we're going to create more realistic debris emission scenes. Basic concept number four, RBD emission source. Okay, yeah, let's start off with the scene that we left off from concept number one, RBD emission. I'm just going to run it. And we have here is a working scene with a platonic geometry being emitted from the curve. So now we're going to replace this, these platonic objects with actual fractured pieces from an object. We can start off with a box and we can just fracture it. And we're going to use what we learned from basic concept number two, RBD fracturing. And this is just going to be a simple fracturing. So if you want to learn more details on how to fracture an object, check out concept number two. We're just going to do a really simple fracture in this case. Okay, let me look at what we have first. Let's drop down an exploded view. This is just for visual purposes. It's not going to affect the scene. These are the fractured pieces that we're going to use to replace these platonic pieces and emit from the curve. This is going to replace this. Now for one thing, this cube is being fractured. All the, these pieces are all over the place. Now I want to center each piece so that so I use all this curve path points, it will actually copy the pieces onto actual center of these points when I use this copy to point node. Right now, these pieces, these fractured pieces are not centered. So there's an offset between the origin, which is right about here. I want to center each blast piece so that when I copy it onto the points on the curve, it will be relatively more centered onto the point. So what I'm going to do is put a for loop down. It'll be a loop going over each connected piece. That means it goes through each blast piece or each fractured piece. So let's iterate through this so you know what I'm doing. So, so you know what's going on. Put the render flag here and let me go over this. You can see that it's going over, let me template this. This for loop is going over each fractured piece that we've made. And what am I going to do with this? Let me turn this off. I'm going to throw down a match size. And this will just, if we leave the second input empty on the match size, it will align the piece right at the center of the origin of the world space, which is the scene, the whole scene. So everything you can see, it's bunched up in the center right now. Now what we need is to sort of pack it, but we're not going to use the symbol pack. We're going to use the RBD configure, which actually packs the geometry for us. Because now the new RBD SOP tools has its own way of packing geometry. And we can adjust we can adjust the parameters for each blast piece, how much it weighs, how bounds, friction, anything you want. Concrete, I'm just gonna leave it as default for now. Now we're gonna do what we did for the platonic pieces. If you can look back over here, you can see the RBD configure. We had an RBD pack. We no longer need the RBD pack because we're using the RBD material fracture node to fracture the geometry and create the pieces. The RBD pack node is usually used when you're dealing with different types of objects that need to be fractured differently. And you want to merge all the fractured objects together in the end to feed into the RBD solver. In this project, we don't have anything that complex. I'm simply fracturing a cube in the simplest way possible. But in other cases, you may be working on destroying a house that deals with fracturing wood into splinters, which is very different from fracturing glass pieces. And that's where the RBD pack node will come in handy, allowing you to separate the fracturing into different steps and still merge it back together later on and feed it into the RBD solver. In Zero, I have a type. And this was just creating a type for each platonic geometry so that it would have a number to it. And then I would use this type. I call it type. You can call it anything you want. As long as it has a unique number to each piece that you want to emit from the RBD emission. So later on in this copy to points node, you can see that I have a type here. So I'm copying the type. I'm instantiating the type onto the points on the curve. So each point here on the curve. Now each point here on the curve is assigned a specific type number, but it's going to be different. Just a little small recap. 
here now i added this piece here we're going to go over this piece of line a little later there's only three types so this vex code here uh, randomly assigns a number to the type of from zero one or two which is the platonic pieces that way i can use the type and then copy it in and every single time it copies it will copy a different object down we need to create that same type attribute to identify each fractured piece. Now, the only issue is, uh, let's take a look at how many pieces we have. It was more simpler when we were dealing with three platonic geometries, one, two, three, or, or sorry, it was zero base. So it was zero, one, or two. So there's three pieces. Very easy to name these. But now, since we're creating more variety and more fractured pieces, this is, gets a little complicated. So let's take a look over here. This has 25 pieces. I don't want to create 25 wrangles and name them one at a time because that's very time consuming. But if you look carefully, since we drop down this RBD configure node, it automatically packs the geometry for us. And if you look into the geometry spreadsheet over here, you'll see that each piece has is a point right now because it's packed geometry. Now let's take a look. It was before the RBD configure. So right at this point here, you can see that we don't have a name. That's one thing. And there's a lot more points. I'm just going to take a look at what we, it is here. It's 290 points. So it's no longer the 25 points. Let's go back to the RBD configure. Now, how do we actually use this? Let's drop down a wrangle. We're going to use the wrangle to assign a unique type number to each blast piece. The wrangle runs through all the points and each point is now representing an RBD piece. All thanks to the RBD configured node that packed the geometry for us. What we need here is some VEX code to assign a unique value to our customly created type attribute for each point. And remember, each point in Houdini always has a unique point number built in. Let's just use the point number. The point number you can see here in the geometry spreadsheet the name is different i'm going to filter out the name so we can see this more clear clearly now you can see that the name is here and the point number over here they're both unique so we have a unique name and a unique point number that means each piece has a unique point number and we can just use this so what we can do is just go i at type that's how we assign i here is it stands for integer i want to create an integer attribute on the points attribute the name of the attribute will be type. And what do I want to give it? Well, let's just use the point number. So at PT num. Now the at symbol here will read in any existing attribute. And this PT num always exists. This is like Dini built in attribute for each point. If we assign it like this, let's see what we get in this geometry spreadsheet. Now I'm gonna filter in the type as well. So you can see here that now we have a type. You can see that the type and the point number are exactly the same because we're reusing the point number and we're just taking that and throwing it into the type. It just works in this case. And we can use this now. So now we've created a type. Now we can use that same way to copy the pieces into our RBD simulation. Now I'm just going to disconnect this. Actually, you know what? Let me name this uh, pieces. So we can disconnect this because we no longer need the platonic pieces or platonic geometries. And now we're going to replace the platonic geometry with our fractured pieces. So we have something more interesting. I'm just going to go over here and just delete all that. Let's move this in, placing all that. Let's see, let's see what this looks like first. Let's run it. I think it's a little small. So one thing is come over to the random attribute randomize and let's make it a little bigger. We added in a bit of random scaling to it. It would scale a different size of the geometry every single time, but it, it's so small just because the platonic pieces, it started off really big. Our fractured pieces here starting off really small. So we can no longer have this. The original P scale randomization range is not suited for this. So let's, let's just boost it up. I'm just going to make this starting off. Let's minimum 0.5 it's never going to be less than 0.5 I'm, I'm going to put maximum as one that's the original size and look you can see it appear in the viewport instantly so let's try this again okay so we're randomly let me template the curve as well so we're randomly getting a different fractured piece for every single point on the curve which is perfect well, let's put the render flag on the rbd solver first and let's test this just run it as is now it works you may notice that all these pieces look 
very similar, like the same piece actually that's being popping out of the curve. And that's because in our over here in this wrangle, where we randomly assign a type value to each point on the curve, it's choosing the numbers between zero and three because we only had three platonic geometries. This time it's different because we have 25. And that brings us into this line of code. I'm going to uncomment this. Well, before I uncomment it, let's actually create it for, I'm going to procedurally detect the total number of pieces in the future. If I ever go back and change the fracturing, say we're going to end up like 60 pieces. This whole thing will automatically update. I won't have to go into the wrangle node and then change this number manually. I don't I don't want to do that. I want something more procedural. So let's do this. How do we actually detect the total number of pieces? Okay, let's come over here. Let's come over here to the number of pieces and look at the geometry spreadsheet. Each piece is a point and the total number of points is 24. It's zero base. So that means there's 25 pieces. There's a few ways where we can do this. Let's drop down a wrangle node. And what we can do is there's a function here in the vex. Well, for one thing, we only want to go over this once. So this needs to be details. If we choose points, it'll go over it 25 times because there's 25 points. We don't want that. We only want to one maximum value. We only, we only need to know it once. So let's switch this to detail. So this code only runs once. The total number of points will give us the total number of fracture pieces because it's uh, the RBD configured node already packs it for us. So we can go end points. We're grabbing the input. Where is the input coming from? Well, from the first input, which is connected to the first input in the wrangle, which here, which is zero base, which is zero actually. So zero, this will give us the total number of points. Where do I want to store this? Well, I want to store it in, in an integer. So let's go like I at num pieces, let's call it. And then equals the total number of points that information will be stored into this attribute in the details so let's take a look put the render flag on this wrangle and let's take a look at the details in the geometry spreadsheet turn off the filter and indeed here we have uh, 25 pieces that's one way you can figure out this information there's actually another way now if you're not too much into wrangles and coding you may prefer this other way now i want to take this and i'm going to drop down an attribute promote. We are going over all the points, but the new class I want this to promote into will still be the details because I only want that total number of pieces information. I only want it once. So we put that there. And then what's the name of the attribute that I want to promote? Like, what am I dealing with? Now here, I'm going to use type. So I want the type to be promoted, but why am I promoting the type? In the promotion method, I can choose maximum. I want the maximum value of the type. What's the maximum value of the type? Well, let's check it out in the geometry spreadsheet over here. Let me turn on my filter again. Okay, you can see that the type is missing. That's because this delete original is here. Now, let disable that, I in, uh, uncheck it, because I want to actually keep the type there. Yeah, you can s now the type attribute comes back. Scroll all the way down. You can see that the largest type value is 24. Because this is zero based, largest type number is the number of pieces plus one because of the zero based. So change name and I'm going to call it num pieces. And if we look back into the geometry spreadsheet on the details, turn off the filter, go to the details attribute here, and you can see that we have num pieces 24. So all you had to do is add one and you know the number of pieces is 25. So you can use it this way. You can do it either way to find out the largest number of pieces. I'm going to add a null here. I'm going to use this way just because this is in a nice 25 value. So let me name this num pieces. How do we use this information? How does it help us when we're randomly choosing the geometry over here? Well, we can first feed in this information into that wrangle, into the second input. And that goes back to this line of code here. Now I'm going to uncomment it and put it in. So number pieces, well, it is an integer. I'm going to call this in num pieces and it's going to be an integer and I'm going to grab it from the details. This num pieces is stored in the details attribute. I'm going to grab it from there, from the first input. It's zero base. So this is zero he uh, here. And then this is one two, three, and, and our num pieces is connected to this socket over here. What do I want? I want the attribute named num pieces. And the zero here is 
if it's like, um, here, let's pull up the tooltip. It is this one. The last argument is always ignored. It is just there so you can change a point point, uh, prim point for a text call. In this case, we don't need to care about it. So we can just, you can just leave it blank. Like you don't even have to put in the zero and it'll still work. So in the previous concept number one, I was randomly choosing a number on each frame. And this random function always gives gives returns a value between zero and one. That's why I use a fit. Tell Houdini, okay, this random function is going to give me something zero to one, but I want something between zero to three because we had three platonic ob objects. This time it's different. We want zero to 25 because we have 25 pieces. Now, I don't want to keep typing in 25, 60. If the next time I have 60 pieces, I don't want to keep typing that in. So this first line of VEX code will procedurally detect how many pieces are in the system. And instead of putting the number 25 here, I'm going to plug in this num pieces variable. So this would automatically update. It's a more, a more procedural workflow this way. Okay, let's give it a try onto the bullet solver and let's see if it'll work. Okay, it is a little harder to tell because I guess the fractured pieces are all similar shaped. What we can do to make this more clear and to double check our work to see if everything's working the way as expected. I'm going to color these pieces. Now let's drop down a color node and color each piece differently. So we can visually have something to verify that each piece is getting a specific type. Let's drop down a color node. Let's unpack because if, if we just drop down a color node right in the middle here, it won't color it. It's because the geometry is packed. So we have to unpack it. And this is going to be colored um, black because we're not going to be using this. This is only to verify things. And I want to transfer the type attribute. So I want to keep that. So let's transfer it back up type. Now let's drop down a color node. And this is going to be black as well because we're not going to be using this. This is only for visual purposes. Now it's going to be a class point wrap from a uh, ramp from attribute. I want to color it from the type now attribute let's drop down the type value a uh, type attribute it's ranging from 0 to 1 which is not what we want because we have the maximum value of the type is 25 so let's plug in 25 here you can see that each piece is now different color but let's make this a little more obvious here to this little wheel and I'm gonna go infrared okay that looks good so now we have a different color slightly different color for each piece when we unpacked the geometry, we changed the format of the fractured pieces, and the RBD solver now has a hard time understanding these fractured pieces. It still looks like it worked, but you can see that some of the pieces, the pieces here, they're colliding with each other, and the RBD solver is not doing anything about it. We're losing some of the collision detection. And that's because we've changed the format of the original RBD pieces. We actually unpacked it here, which is not a good thing. Like all I wanted to do was debug it and make sure each piece that we're emitting from the curve was unique. In that case, that worked well. But would I use this unpack right before the RBD solver and after the RBD configure? No. Unpacking it changes the format. The RBD configure puts these blast pieces in the correct format that we need. And what we have here, it just changes everything. But it works fine to just debug the scene and just to verify that if we're getting a different piece every single time. So I can just move this aside and we're not going to be using it. Let's connect what we had before. What I want to show you is that the, these pieces are actually colliding with each other. So you can see that they're moving out of the way there's actually collision going on. Like they would move over. See, this guy, this piece knocks the smaller piece in. Here, it would knock it over. So there's actually collision going on. So that's something you need to be aware of. Be aware when you're unpacking the geometry of the original RBD SOP tools. It, it will make a difference. In the next video, we'll start to have some fun with all the things we've learned so far. We'll get to put all the skills from basic concept one through four and create a more practical scene. Thanks for watching and sticking to the end.